Hey guys, I want you to know I love you dearly and I have been praying for you and thanking God for you through a certain passage of scripture, uh, Colossians 1, 1 to 14, for almost every day the last three months. I'm so excited that last week and this week we finally get to talk about this. And so let's start with this question for all of us, wherever you're at, do you pray? Do you pray? I might might ask the follow-up question like, well, so what is prayer? Uh, What counts as prayer, so to speak? So, I mean, there's a variety of ways you can pray. You can talk to God, listen to God, thank God. That's prayer. When you sing songs to God, when you, like, write a letter to God, when you're simply aware of his presence, all of those things are prayer. So, again, do you pray? There's likely three types of answers people have right now. No, sometimes, and yeah, it's a lifestyle. For those of you guys who are no, I don't pray, maybe you once prayed and stopped for whatever reason, or you've never prayed, our hope is that God moves in your life. You begin a conversation with God. God created you to communicate with him. And so begin talking to him, praying. For those of you who are sometimes people, maybe you're, when you're prompted, so you're prompted, it's bedtime, it's time to pray. It's, it's meal time, it's time to pray. It's crisis time. You're like a 911 prayer guy. You know, we all got that friend. Uh, you, you probably have that friend. You know that guy? Uh, that guy, when that guy calls you, you love that guy. But you're like, oh boy. Because that guy only calls when they want something. You know that guy? We've all got that friend. Some of us are that guy with God. So we don't talk to him or thank him or think about him until, dear Lord, we want, got stuff for you to do. And some of you are that guy. You're a sometimes prayer guy. Uh, some of us um, have built a lifestyle where it's an every day, throughout the day, that's our hope, that's our goal. You might wonder, why would I pray? Like, on a regular basis. So many reasons. Like, when you pray, God promises that your soul gets in a better space. You experience his, his presence, his joy. He's worthy of praying alone without getting any benefits. He is worthy. Uh, but write this verse down and check it out. James 4.2. This changed my life as a young Christian. James 4.2 says, sometimes you don't have something because you're not praying for it. You're not asking. Sometimes you don't have it because you're not asking. Years ago, I was a, like a young discipler, kind of a young one-on-one men's group, me and a friend named Eric who I'd led to Jesus, and I was discipling him, teaching him things like baptism and how to serve, but he wasn't getting baptized and wasn't serving, and I was getting frustrated, like, what is wrong? And God reminded me of James 4.2, The Holy Spirit's like, have you prayed for him? I became convicted. Before I get frustrated with somebody, I should be praying for them on that very thing, prayer before frustration. Frustration leading to prayer. Sometimes you don't have something because you're not asking. So yeah, prayer is huge. Why would God do that to us when he knows we need something? Because he's a good dad. He's a good parent. Uh, We have three kids, Kathy and I do. And one of ours is 10 years old. And we're teaching her things like, please, please, and thank you, and patience, and she's not the center of the universe. Why? We're trying to be good parents. God's a good dad, and there are sometimes he doesn't give you something until you pray for it, because he's trying to teach you, you're not God. You're not in charge. He's teaching you how to be communicating with God, depending on God, seeing him as your provider. Prayer is huge. It's like spirituality 101, entry-level stuff. Uh, A follow-up question, though. Do you pray for Grace Church? Do you pray for God to protect, move, bless Grace Church? Uh, I guess I'm talking to gracers with this one. It's, it'd be odd if you're not a gracer and praying for us. We're thankful. We'd benefit. But if you're a gracer, we need your prayers. I need your prayers. I do believe God has blessed us over the years and protected us. Blessed me, protected me and all of us. Because there's people talking about me behind my back with God. Begging God. Talk about us behind our back, begging God for him to move. We need your prayers. Today, we're going to study a 2,000-year-old prayer. Paul's sitting in jail. Timothy is with him. He hears about a church 1,200 miles away. And in jail, he begins thanking God for them, and they begin praying for them. We're going to study that passage, this 2,000-year-old prayer in three sections, see what they prayed for the church of Colossae, and we're going to all pause And we're going to pray for the people of Grace Church, for God to move in and through us. So let's pray and ask God to help us do that today. God, we come to you, and we thank you, God, for your word and Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and the gospel. And we thank you that 
You've made a way for us to communicate to you, with you. We don't have to go be somewhere specific. We don't have to go through another person. We can go directly to you, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, and that you bring our prayers directly to God. Help us by your Spirit. Learn the types of things that you'd like us to pray for our church, Grace Church. And then help us in the Spirit. Pray for the people of grace. And would you hear these prayers, the thousands of prayers offered today, and would you answer them in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We are here in 2024 through our One Church Initiative. And it's really about believing God in new ways, this two-part promise in Romans 12, verse 5. Romans 12, 5 says this. Paul wrote, So we, being many, are one body in Christ. And individually, members of one another. This is a tremendous two-part promise that us growing this year, all of us in believing the fact that we're part of one body. Our church is like like a human body. We're all body parts. We need the body for life. The body needs us, believing we're one body and individually made for deep connection, just like Jesus had. He showed what it looks like to have deep community and connection with other people. This new series we started is from the book of Colossians. Colossians is a small book, a letter Paul and Timothy wrote from jail. It takes you 10 minutes, 12 minutes to read or listen to, so you can listen to it once a week or once a day for that matter, 10, 12 minutes. We're calling this Walking Together, our church walking together with God based on what Paul and Timothy said they wrote this for. Colossians 1.10, we write this so that you, that's the church, may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. That's our desire these next several weeks as we walk through Colossians together that, at, that we, our church, Grace Church, begins walking together in new ways which are worthy of God. That in new and deeper ways we fully please him. That's our hope. So some background on Colossians. I gave them more detail last week. Please pick up week one if you missed it. But as I said, this is a letter written from jail. Paul and Timothy are inspired by the Holy Spirit. They hear from a minister at Colossae who was now in Rome. They wrote these letters. They sent two letters, one to the church, the book of Colossians, one to an individual, a leader in the church, Philemon. Those were hand-carried by two couriers there. Last week, we read the first eight verses and thanked God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. This week, the next several verses, uh, verses 9 to 14, if you want to join me, we're going to see what Paul and Timothy prayed from jail for that church and in three, three parts, learn and then pause to pray. Learn and pause to pray. Learn and pause to pray. Again, do you pray for Grace Church? We need it. I need it. If not, no condemnation. We can start today. So, I'm going to read to this section right here. It's just Colossians 1, verse 9 to 14. What were these two guys praying for while they're sitting in jail? They write this. For this reason, we also... Since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. There's our theme verse. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, this is like thick and rich and deep. It's like uh, this part of the scripture that reminds me of flourless chocolate cake, you know, like rich and thick and deep. And so we're going to unpack this in three sections. 
Uh, so what is Paul and Timothy praying for from jail for this church? They're praying that they could be filled with God and then transform, change by God and be thankful in response. And yes, it's like, like an ecosystem here. The filling from God in our church, we're gonna pray for, that he changes us and then we're thankful in response. That's what we're gonna be praying for. Let's see what Paul and Timothy do pray for. If you look at the first couple of verses, in verses nine and 10, they're praying for the church to be filled with God's will, pleasing God, and knowing God. And I've prayed for you most every day for three months now that you personally, Grace Church, would be filled with God's will, filled with pleasing God, filled with knowing him more. He makes the comment in verse nine, um, right out of the gate, like he, ha- he doesn't cease to pray for them. And, uh, well, you might make the case, well, he's got a little more time than you because he is sitting in jail, and that is true. But to their credit, they are led by the Spirit to use that time not to complain or sue or whatever, but to actually pray for other people. And I, I do pray for you, Grace Church, and I wanna be faithful to stand before you and God at the end of my ministry, whenever that is, and say, listen, I have not ceased to pray for you. I've not stopped. And if you've stopped praying for grace, like how do I start again? Ask God. Put somewhere on your prayer list or on your task list, pray that I pray for Grace Church. Pray for yourself once a day. Help me pray for Grace Church. And that's the kind of prayer God wants to answer. So he's praying for us to be filled. Filled with three things. His will, pleasing him, knowing him better. If you look at verse, in verse nine, I have prayed so many times for God to fill you, Grace Church with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. When you study the will of God, you might wonder, what is the will of God? So there's two types of will of, will of God in scripture. There's a general will of God, which is for everybody. That's calls of God, commands for all of us. And then there's specific will of God for your life uniquely. And to God, the general will for all of us is more important, that's where you start. And then after you start exploring that, then he gives you your specific will for your, for your life. How do you find the will of God? It's not a mystery. You type in the word will. Will of God, willing, and study every time he talks about his will, and you're gonna find the kinds of things that I've been praying you're filled with. What is the will of God? That your mind is transformed by him. What is the will of God? You give yourself to your church. What is the will of God? You give financially to your church to God through your church. What is the will of God? You invest spiritual things in your soul. What is the will of God? You abstain from sexual sins. What is the will of God? You thank God at all times. You find those by typing in the word will in a basic Bible search program like Bible Gateway. So I've been praying that you be filled with his will, the knowledge of his will. I've been praying you fill that. And also that you'd know that what you're doing as a child, student, adult, your unique will of God for your journey, that you're in his will as well, filled with that will. I prayed you're filled with God's will. They also prayed that the church would please God, which is our theme verse, that Colossians 1.10. If you look at verse 10, the phrase is fully pleasing him. Walking worthy of him, fully pleasing him. It's no mystery what pleases God. Like, he revealed it in scripture. How do you find that? A basic Bible search program. Go to BibleGateway.com, type in the word please or pleasing or pleasure, joy. Find every time God talks about what brings him pleasure or joy, you'll find things like Matthew 3. When a child of his follows the Holy Spirit, is obedient, it brings God pleasure. That's Jesus when he's baptized. My son, I'm well pleased. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. He says, you know what brings me pleasure? When you share share the story of Jesus, tell people about Jesus, and they think you're foolish for doing it, that brings me pleasure. The foolishness of the message that people share. Hebrews 11, when you believe God, without faith, it is impossible to please him. When you believe God, it brings him pleasure. I've been praying you're filled with a desire to please God more and more, and been praying that you would know God more and more. That's in verse 10. Increasing in the knowledge of God. You continually increase. So no one ever arrives. 
we don't arrive. God's an infinite God. We continue learning about God. The day you stop learning more about God is the day you start sliding away from God. He's an infant God. Uh, I've been learning about God as I've been praying and accidentally starting to memorize sections of Colossians 1, 1 to 14, thinking about the gospel and Jesus and you and the church and myself. I've been learning more about God. My daughter this week was learning more about God. So she went through a challenge and I pointed out, you know, the back of your Bible has a list of verses that deal with several challenges, including that challenge. She went back and found a verse. It was so cool. Back from Isaiah. She wrote that verse down, does what dad, mom do, write the verse down, you pray that verse. The next day, her teacher in a Christian school assigned uh, out of the 31,000 plus Bible verses, that verse. <laughs> My daughter at 10 is increasing more in the knowledge of God. So Paul and Timothy prayed for those three things. I've been praying for you. Let's all pause right now and do the very same thing. Let's pause and pray. Would you pray for the people of Grace Church that we be filled with God's will, fully please God, and know God better? Go ahead and pray for our church. God, I also, again, um, I pray you would fill Grace Church. Fill us with yourself. Fill us with the knowledge of your will, what you revealed your will is for all of us in general and us specifically. I pray you'd help us to fully fill us with a desire to fully please you and fill us by knowing you more and more, increasing in the knowledge of God, which would fill us with yourself, Lord. Amen. All right, so Paul and Timothy sitting in jail, and they prayed for three things for this church, 1,200 miles away, Church of Colossae. Uh, they'd be filled with God and then changed by God. And I'll read this verse again. It's verse 11. It says this. He says, we're praying for you, and I prayed for you guys, Grace Church, to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Three things he's praying for that God would change them. They'd be changed with God's strength, God's patience, and God's joy and suffering. Change with God's strength. We all need God's strength. I need God's strength. You need God's strength. Every day God gives us strength to get up, to live our lives. All those things are gifts from God, whether you realize it or not. And it's the weirdest thing. So like we really, like some of you, you're like, yes, I need strength. And if you're thinking that or feeling that, it's because you feel the lack of strength. You feel your weakness. That's the weird thing that God does. Uh, so if you look, Paul tells his story in 2 Corinthians 12 that he had a physical ailment that he prayed three times to get rid of and he felt very weak and unable to go on to navigate this problem. And God told him, I'm not gonna heal you. I'm leaving it there because of the danger of arrogance for you because I've shown you so many things. I've re re revealed heaven to you, all the scriptures. And by the way, Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. I've been praying for you to, to feel God's strength. It's one of the quotes that I heard from Rick Warren years ago. I don't like it, but I believe it. Rick Warren said, you know, the weird thing about growing in an area is, is you must be tempted with the opposite to grow in that area. So if God's gonna grow you in, in patience, let's say, he's gonna tempt you with being impatient. And God's strength is to wait on him. So we all need God's strength. I've been praying for God's strength according to his glorious creation, resurrection power, which lives in you. Inside the Holy Spirit, you've got the power of creation, the power of the resurrection, in you and the Holy Spirit, if you know Christ as Savior. The second thing he's praying, for God's strength to change them, God's patience to change them. God's patience. That's really when you start to see God's strength. What is Patience. It's the strength to wait on God when you don't want to wait on God. 
when you want to fast track it, when you want to fix it yourself, force others to do your will. He was praying uh, for them to have such strength from God, the strength that people can sense through patience. Our God is a patient God. It's his strength. The strength to be patient. How patient is God? Well, if you look at my life, he waited almost 20 years, 19 and a half years, for me to receive Jesus. Talk about waiting patiently for me. Some of you, he waited five years, 50 years. Some people here, he'd been waiting for decades on something else. Not you get to receive Christ, but there's other decisions or steps of faith take, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits, because he's kind and good, and he can outwait you. Like, he is so patient. And Paul was, Timothy were praying for this church that you would have the strength to wait on God when it's his job to do it and not yours. And then, praying that they'd be changed by the strength, patience, and then joy in suffering. Joy in suffering. And some of you are suffering right now. You're in a situation that's not good. The problem is not getting better. And you don't see any progress on it. And you know what real strength is? When you experience joy while you suffer and it's not getting better. Joy. How's it happen? So for me, um, it's when I connect with God and think about all the things he has given me that this temporary crisis can't take away. That's kind of in the third thing we're praying for. So I've been praying the Lord's Prayer at the start of my devotional time since early last fall-ish. Um, so I usually start off by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven. You know, just praying the Lord's Prayer. And what the Lord's Prayer does for me every single time, because I got my stuff and my problems, is I put God first. I think about him being over everything and being a great dad. I think about his will being done. And then I say, God, would you help me with my needs today? My daily bread means just today's stuff. I don't need to fix tomorrow's stuff. I fix the whole problem. But I need help today to win today with you. And I've experienced joy because I'm not mired in the muck of my daily problems. Because I'm praying the Lord's Prayer and I'm spending time with God and I got a, a godly wife who reminds me of all the things we have. We, when we want to focus on the things we don't have, all those kind of things. Let's pause. Would you pray for Grace Church? Would you pray that we're changed by God's strength in us? That we're changed. We see God's patient, patience in us. That we're changed to experience His joy in suffering. Pray for our church right now. God, I pray again for Grace Church. Just like Paul and Timothy prayed for the church at Colossae, Please, 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 Lord, would your Holy Spirit change us and give us the strength of God inside of us. Change us to live in your patience inside of us. Change us to experience your joy in our suffering when it's not getting better. God, that is real godly strength. Please change us. I pray for every man, woman, and student and child of grace. Amen. Amen. Paul and Timothy prayed for three things. For, us, for them to be filled with God, this church, fill them with God, and then change them uh, by God. And then he's praying they could be thankful. So my wife and I pray for our kids. Pray for our church. Pray for ourselves. That we cannot be that guy, that gal, who gets stuff and is not thankful to God in response. Specifically, what Paul and Timothy are praying for is the church can be thankful that they have an inheritance, a kingdom, and forgiveness. Like a true eternal inheritance. God's kingdom and total forgiveness. So if you look at verse 12, that's where he says we're giving thanks to the Father. I'm praying for you that you would give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance 
of the saints in the light. There's the word inheritance. The weird thing about our human inheritance, maybe you've gotten a, a lot of inheritance given to you. Maybe your parents didn't have very much. You didn't give any inherit, get any inheritance. Maybe you're thinking about the inheritance you'll pass on. But guess what? The day you die, your inheritance you have goes to zero. Goes to zero. There are no, I heard years ago, there are no U-Hauls on the back of hearses. Can't take it with you. But guess what? If you're a Christian, you have a real spiritual, eternal inheritance. You're a child of the king, a prince or princess of almighty God. Your real inheritance, that he's saying, I wish you'd thank God for the real inheritance you have, is you have the riches of Jesus. His love, his joy, his grace, his peace. You've been forgiven. You have eternal life. You'll live forever. You'll have heart connection with God and other people. No sin, no sadness, no tears, no death. You're a joint heir of the universe with Jesus Christ. That's just a a slice of your spiritual inheritance. He's praying, they're praying, Paul and Timothy. Dear God, help this church to focus on their real inheritance, their spiritual, eternal inheritance, to thank you for all the things they have. They can't lose. Not the things they don't have in this life. And then, God help that church be thankful for their new kingdom. They have a new kingdom. And he talks, uh, he talks in verse 13 that every one of us, before you meet Jesus, you were under the power of darkness. God delivered you from the darkness kingdom to the kingdom of the son of his love. Every one of us, when you were not a Christian, before receiving Christ, you're blind, deaf, a slave to sin, dead spiritually, no hope, no life. And the day you receive Jesus, me at 19 years old in Blue Springs, you get to be part of a new kingdom. You got a new passport, new citizenship, new allegiance, a new leader who's always good and always right and never dies and never changes, a different culture in this kingdom with different ways. We can thank God for the totally new kingdom, a new citizenship we have. And he prays they'd be thankful for, for total forgiveness. Total forgiveness. Verse 14, he talks about receiving the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. When you and I receive Jesus, our sins are dark and staining. And we can't get rid of the stains of sins on our own. But Jesus, through his sacrifice, his death and resurrection, his blood, he washes us clean. How clean? Well, Isaiah says forgiveness of sin is like the whiteness of snow. When you see snow covering an entire horizon, as far as you can see, all the dirt that was there is just covered over. It's just brilliant, crystal clear light. That's forgiveness. So writer in Psalm, Psalm 103, says forgiveness is like your sins being taken away from you as far as the east is from the west. You can go forever east, forever west. That's how forever, as far as your sins are from you. Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, Jesus, because he died for you, makes you spotless. All the spots and stains of sin, like it was never there. And so what Paul and Timothy were praying that church would start to be thankful for, like they'd be actually thankful for their true spiritual inheritance, for God's kingdom, for total forgiveness. Would you pray for Grace Church and we could be thankful for those three things as well? Let's pause and pray for us to be thankful for those. God, again, I pray and we pray for Grace Church to be thankful. That's a work of your spirit, not to be unthankful and moving on with our lives, but to be thankful for three really specific things. Help Grace Church, every person, to be thankful for their, for their true spiritual inheritance. Their joint heirs with Jesus and have a new citizenship in a new kingdom with new ways and a new leader and living forever. Oh, to be incredibly thankful for their new inheritance and to be thankful for their new kingdom, that they were under slavery in darkness. 
and you transported us to the kingdom of your son. And may all of us, I pray for every person at Grace, could be so thankful for total forgiveness of sins. Not for what we've done, for what you did through your death and resurrection. Help us to be thankful for those. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So before we started today, I said, do you pray? And do you pray for Grace Church? So what just happened is so cool. This weekend, thousands of people are praying for Grace Church. Maybe more than ever, which is incredible. So I'm so thankful. Can you imagine, imagine, imagine how God is going to begin and continue answering prayers. Prayers, by the way, don't expire. They are eternal. They don't go bad. There's no way best, best by date on them. You toss them in the trash. Your prayer just lasts and lasts. It's eternal work. What is God going to do with our thousands of prayers? My follow-up question is this. Would you? Would you pray for Grace Church? Would you start praying for Grace Church or restart praying for Grace Church on a periodic basis? I need your prayers. We need your prayers. When you pray for Grace Church and your Grace Church, you're praying for yourself as well and all of us. We need to pray. You say, how do I remember to do that? Ways that I've reminded myself to pray for certain things. I shared one of the ways is I put on my task list, help me pray or pray that I could pray for Grace Church. That's one of the ways I've done it. Every day, and I, I pause. Dear Lord, I'm a kind of task list guy. I like check, checking the box, right? Uh, yes, I do pray. Would you remind me to pray for Grace Church? Oh, and yes, and now I pray for Grace Church for these kinds of things. You could pray Colossians 1, 1 to 14, like I've been doing for almost every day for three months or so now. You could pray the two chunks, the thanking God section, praying uh, for us section. It's what the Spirit reveals those things. You can make a prayer list. You could put a phone alarm. I use my phone alarm to remind me at certain times of day to pray for certain things. The phone alarm goes off. Oh yeah, and I pause and I pray for that. But whatever way God uses, however you're wired, would you begin praying on a periodic basis for Grace Church? And if you are not a Christian, uh, I'm so thankful you're here. Maybe you never pray and this is so weird and maybe you're getting a glimpse of what the Christian life looks like. Uh, it's a better life, a life with Jesus Christ. Has this happened to you? I'll read one verse we read across, didn't unpack it very much for you, but Colossians 1.13, you're not a believer. Colossians 1.13 says, He, Jesus, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Has this happened to you? Do you sense to your soul you've been delivered? Do you sense to your soul you've been conveyed to a new kingdom? Do you sense the difference years ago? I sensed it over the first few days of my brand new Christianity at 19. I sense the difference inside of me. That's the Holy Spirit. I continue to sense the difference. And if not, please, please, please. Jesus Christ came for you. He loves you. He died for you. He rose for you. And he set this all up. He orchestrated this so you would receive him as Lord and Savior. Would you receive him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the chance as a church to learn this 2,000-year-old prayer that Paul and Timothy prayed for the Church of Colossae. And then thank you for the thousands of prayers this weekend being offered by people through that same 2,000-year-old prayer. Please hear those prayer requests. And we pray you'd answer them. They are the will of God because you reveal in Scripture what your will is. And I pray for those who have not yet been delivered and transported in your kingdom. Please reveal to them it's time for them to receive Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.